In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I am so grateful to be here. The way that David framed it uh, made it sound as if he, uh, I was doing you all a favor. The, the truth of the matter is, he mentioned that I have three children. They are five, six, and eight. Now you tell me who was running from town. <laughs> I, I point that out only because I am a servant of the gospel, but I also have been a mother for three years. And, and I am finding that I will go wherever God sends me. <laughs> I am so grateful that uh, my partner in ministry, my partner in marriage, and my partner in parenting is here with me today, the Reverend Jeff Hall. Uh, we would have allowed him to stay, but we have discovered that our five-year-old has figured out the Amazon code, and she has been purchasing uh, the entire Dora collection <laughs> since sometime yesterday. Uh, hopefully there will be money left in the account, um, but he is going immediately, like Mark would say, to the airport to take her tablet from her. <laughs> now, the worst thing happened last night, Jeff and I, after the movie, uh, he started telling me all of the people, the esteemed preachers and theologians who have held this lectureship over the last 56 years, colleagues and teachers and theologians and many renowned preachers, even one personal friend, all of which I have to tell you I have long admired. Therefore, you know, to see my name on that list, I, first I had to think, what were they thinking? <laughs> I have to tell you I'm very filled with gratitude. I'm overwhelmed by the company you have asked me to keep. And I need to thank both David and the committee for their gracious invitation and their warm hospitality. I guess I also need to thank those of you who have been here since 8.30 who have to hear this again. <laughs> now the temptation is uh, for a guest preacher, especially when they find out they're gonna be on TV, is to swing for the fences, but fight above their weight class, become some preacher that they normally are not. I am not going to do that today because out of a Lenten sacrifice, I'm simply going to be me. <laughs> now, you know, let me just be kind of honest with you. Being me is not that bad. I mean, I'm holding up pretty well for a girl in uh, her 50th year, plus two. Um, <laughs> especially uh, an old girl who has a five, a six, and an eight-year-old. Now, I'm going to tell you one of the things I've learned about having children is that I think children are our parents' revenge <laughs> on us because these children have a way of uncovering every flaw and foible and secret that you thought you held so closely that you've paid people off to hide, all kinds of things. You just thought that they were gone. And suddenly, once there are children in your life, all of your stuff comes to light. 
Recently, my sister was visiting, and my children were doing what I call the vaudeville act. Uh, we have our eight-year-old is our budding artist, our inherently lazy son, um, who believes that bathing is optional, um, but eating is not. Uh, he's kind of a drama king. And then there's my six-year-old, my Pharisee in training, my um, Viking in training, because she's not met a wall, a door, a car that she can't destroy. And then there's the princess, she of Dora fame, um, who also, and they were all dancing around. And what we noticed, Jeff and I, was that the Viking, Harmony, was struggling to keep the beat. Um, she was so far behind the beat that the song was over for about five minutes before she realized it. Now, my sister, my younger sister, whom I have called many names, I did not ask for her. I asked for a puppy. <laughs> I've sort of worked through that. I realize she's going nowhere. This spawn of the nether regions was trying to comfort my daughter. And she said, oh, Harmony, don't worry, baby. That's OK, because your mother can't dance either. All of a sudden, three pairs of little eyes fall on me. My face became really hot when I realized I was going to start getting those questions. So, Mommy, why can't you dance? Mommy, do you need to take lessons? And of course, my eight-year-old son, who can never resist the ability to stab it and shank it, said, but aren't all of us supposed to know how to dance? <laughs> I could tell by the questions that I was losing major cool points. The only retort I could master after all these years of education and communication was simply, well, I can dance if I want to, I just choose not to. <laughs> but friends, I'm not going to lie to you, I can't dance. I'm gifted in music theory. I play two instruments. I have a killer golf game. Make a mean macaroni and cheese casserole. But the truth of the matter is, I'm not going to appear in Swan Lake or American Bandstand or even Lawrence Welk. I simply cannot dance. I'm really what you would call a chair dancer. You know, from the shoulders up, I'm kind of looking good. If you pass me in my minivan, I look like I'm backing up for, you know, Taylor Swift or Madonna. But if you get below that and put me out on the floor, it is a horrible sight to see. I think I'm even embarrassed to admit that I can't follow the instructions for line dancing. My beloved mentor, Arthur Mitchell, the first African-American man to solo at the American Ballet and the founder of the Dance Theater of Harlem always believed that anyone could learn to, la to dance if they followed two simple steps. Our gospel reading continues our emphasis on the work of Mark. The gospel I like to call the USA Today version of the gospels. It's noted for its lack of a birth narrative its lack of rhetorical flourish, and its seemingly overabundance of the word immediately and semicolons. Now, I am not a fan of Mark, my husband will tell you. I almost boycott the entire year of the lectionary when Mark is the gospel. Yet Mark's simplicity belies its importance as one of the key sources for the other Gospels. Both Matthew and Luke will use Mark's work and embellish it for their own audiences. The text verses 9 through 15 pack a lot of action into six verses. Now here's everything that's going on in these six verses. Jesus gets baptized by John. 
There's a proclamation and a showing up of the Holy Spirit. There is Jesus being driven out to the wilderness, an appearance of Satan, some angels, and some wild beasts. Jesus is, John is arrested, and Jesus starts his public ministry. All of that happens in six verses. Now, homiletically, frankly, it's too daunting, and we don't have time for me to go through every one of these scriptures. So I want to pay attention just to verse 15, which says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Again, characteristic of Mark, much is packed in these 37 words that make up this verse. While it's deceptively benign, this text contains everything you need to become a disciple of Christ. Within this text, the first thing we are reminded of is the good news. Now, friends, I'm going to opine just for a moment, a very quick moment. I think it's useful having a clock right there. Um, I think there's been a great deal of confusion over the nature of the good news. We've lost both the simplicity and the power of what the good news is. The good news is not that the church was established. The good news is not a promise of prosperity. The good news is not a promise about smooth sailing in your life. The good news is not the birth of Christ. The good news is not the fact that Jesus died. The good news is not even that Jesus got up on Easter morning. No, friends, the good news is that God wants to begin again with us. God's good news is that God has come to us and extended us away out of the mess we've created. The good news is that God has refused to let us wallow in our fears, our insecurities, our anger, our misshapen ideas of religiosity, and it instead is willing to clean up the mess once and for all. The good news is that instead of farming out the job to some third party or some crusty prophet, that God has decided in God's infinite wisdom to clean up the aisle mess on aisle one that's in our lives for God's self. The good news is that God is willing to take the wheel. The good news is that God invites us to shift our loyalties from human leaders and structures praying for some kind of salvation and instead offering us the only source for eternal peace and salvation. The good news is that God has not given up on us. The good news is that God came looking for us even when we didn't know we were lost. God's answer comes to us. God's good news comes to us with an offer that doesn't require layaway, those of you who are old enough to remember that, nor does it require two-day prime delivery. The terms of this good news is clear, repent and believe. It's a simple two-step that even someone like me can follow. Repentance is not a rehearsal of your sins. Even for, for recovering Baptists like myself, that's kind of hard to believe. It's the recognition that your mindset is wrong. It's the recognition that your way didn't work. It's the recognition that, oh my goodness, I have created this mess for myself. Repentance is a willingness to turn away to turn completely around. Metanoia is the word. It means to literally turn around and go a different direction. Repentance means, friends, that we give up being in control and making little gods out of ourselves. Repentance, as any married person will tell you, is hard. Because it means that you reach out your hand and you say you're sorry and you ask for something you're not even deserving of. Repentance is asking for a second chance. Repentance is not humanly possible, which is, again, the second part. Believing the good news. 
Believing the good news that when you reach out your hand, God's hand is already there waiting for us. When we are ready to run from our demons and we run from the wild beast of life that's chasing us, standing at the end of that road is God waiting to embrace us. That's what we are called to believe. That's how we are given the power to repent. Repent and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a simple two-step that even a girl with two left foot can figure out. Amen.